Our second speaker is Dr. Paul Davidson, who is, for those who don't know, is our driving, one of our main driving forces for our hearing and voice programs. He's a psychologist in the area that works at the uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, you know, uh, what I like is what he says. In our program, it does hearing men's voices, but in his real job, he helps men with their voices. It's the club building. That way. Well, we're delighted to have you guys here. Um, I hope you're enjoying yourselves. Uh, you know, one of the questions that you were asked uh, in the introduction was, you know, what are you personally going to do to make sure you have an outstanding experience? So, you know, listening to some of the people who are here talking to each other, you know, learning from Rabbi Simon is one of the ways you can be sure of that. So we're going to be talking about concerning Judaism at the crossroads of being a man in the 21st century. So what we're going to be focusing on are the changing roles of men. And, and advance it. If you take a look, you know, we started in the 1950s. What was the name of this show? <laughs> Auto Fest. Do we see that on TV anymore? Yes. No. Yes. This yes. is the evolution of man. No, 60s, not too bad. He's still at the head of the table with the biggest. 1970s, we start to see the wonder years. The dad's there, but he's moved out a little. We start to see the kids start to become more central. 1980s, who was in the center of the family? Roseanne. Roseanne. 1990s, what are men relegated to? <laughs> 2013, modern family, the family has changed. What are the roles the men typically play in this show? Are they the uh, wisest individuals? Are they the ones most respected? No. Things have changed dramatically. So, who makes up our population? Most recent census, 2010. Males, 49.2. Females, 50.8. So just so we understand numerically, we're just a little bit less than that. Let me start to look at trends that have been happening, you know, especially over the last 40 or plus years. So if we start with education, adults 25 to 29 with bachelor's degrees, we see that roughly 20% of men you know, are graduating degrees and about 12.5% of women. Over the ensuing 40 years, we see a shift right around the 1990s where all of a sudden women start to overtake the males. There's a good news to this thing. We see more education as time goes on. But if you look at the male education, it's almost flatlined. We're dead. Okay? <coughs> Women now represent a majority of college undergraduates and make up nearly three fifths of graduate students. So please, this is a very complicated slide. The most important thing I want to point out to you, though, is that if you take a look at these degree changes among women, in 1970, we saw 39.7% of people who were getting masters were female. By 2009, 60% of women are. Only 5.7% were getting professional degrees. Now we're seeing 48.9% of professional doctoral degrees. Women made up 13.3%. 2009, they now make up 52.5%. This is wonderful for women. Well, what does this say about men? Because if this percentage is increasing, guess what we're going to do now? I do want to understand, this is a bizarre looking slide, but this shows that this phenomenon is, it's really more North America, it's not worldwide. So what you're looking at is a global map that shows where there are, are more males enrolled in tertiary, so we're talking about college degrees, uh, over women. And you'll see the United States is this, it's, it's a lie. There's no volume to it because women are outstripping men. But you take a look at Asia, uh, you know, especially Asia, the African subcontinent, and so on, we see a dramatic difference. A little bit in South America, but for the most part, we look at the Americas. Israel, you can't see because it, there are so many women getting degrees. And also, you know, England, France, uh, Spain, these are all countries where women are, are getting degrees at a very high percentage. 
Next slide, please. Okay. So we take a look at what's going on. We understand that men are just a little under 50% of the population. We now see the fields of psychology, mind, pediatrics, social services, elementary education are fields in which women now are dominant. It wasn't the case when I started out. Women thus provide the majority of treatment and education to boys. This is very, very important because we have to look where the information is coming from. The sad fact is it's not coming from men. Next slide, please. Okay. This looks very complicated, but the bottom line here, this is a change in women's salaries relative to men. What we see here is an ongoing increase, uh, bless you, uh, and this is broken down by how old somebody is. You don't need to know the specifics, but in general, we see a significant trend upwards. Again, not a bad thing, but what this does lead to is an imbalance we start to see a little bit later. Next slide. So what are guys doing? We're playing sports and we're really good at video games. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Next slide. When it comes to Jewish education, though, do you like this slide? Do you want to play it? All right. So in the American Jewish world, however, we see that males and females are seeking college and graduate education is on equal level. Uh, but there, now we start to see that Jewish women in general may be starting to do better in undergraduate and graduate programs than men. Next slide. So we take a look at the Jewish trend. So I showed you the picture of popularized male role models on TV. If we start to go back in Jewish male history and the father figure, what was happening? What was the role of men? You know, everything was men. There were no women in these pictures. This was a groundbreaking ceremony for a synagogue probably in the 19th century. A couple of women. All the learning that was taking place, it was focused on the guys. There was no such thing as bat mitzvah. There was no such thing as women rabbis, women catchers. And again, these aren't bad things. They're good to have. We start to see a shift, and by the time this is a, this is a, I forget, I don't know what Men's Club or Brotherhood this is, but I pulled it off the Brotherhood website. Uh, we start to see much more egalitarianism in the movie, which is good. Whoa, look at this Seda. Not too shy. That's Barack Obama. The White House on its first scene. And we start to see a split. We start to see the role of men becoming a little bit more political. And now we start to take a look at uh, you know, activism. And it's, it's really more about equal rights. It's not really about men's issues per se. OK, next slide, please. So teenage boys, this is from a study called Movie Tradition, significantly less Jewishly engaged than Jewish girls of the same age. So they, we get these track guys, Jewish guy. And then we take a look at this. Um, and this is, I don't know if anybody can read this. This is the uh, College of Charleston, it's Charleston, South Carolina. Christian men are less involved in religious life in college than Christian men. The Christian women, my bad. Men are notoriously bad at grammar, by the way. not just a light bulb. I have an exemplar man in that. As Jewish men are less religiously involved on campus than Jewish women. And take a look at the hillouts. We're starting to look at conservative male involvement. Many, many more females are involved than men. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So what's a father to do? So these are some of the life cycle events that we look at. We want to raise them to study, to kupa, to good deeds. We've never really fully provided parents, especially fathers, the data they need to make educated decisions about parenting. So let's go on to understand a little bit the next question, which is, why are there differences? So let's take a look. Next slide. So is it because we're wired differently? Well, one of the things we know is that boys tend to be less socially engaged, and this is a typical boy playing with his gun, and girls tend to be more socially engaged, and they're on the bed, and they do nails, and they play dolls, and these kind of things. It's very typical. Next slide. This really should explain everything. <laughs> <laughs> University rigorously studied and been done multinationally. We can all relate to this. All right, but there's actually some stuff. There's some puppy stuff too. Next slide. All right, now we start to take a look at the actual. Don't you love that slide? That was a beauty. So men. <laughs> Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Men have six and a half 
times the amount of gray matter than women, and women have nearly 10 times the amount of white matter than men. So gray matter uh, here represents information processing. This is discrete processing. Thing. So men are much better typically at focusing in on a specific task and learning a skill, learning something well. So white I matter. Be discrete. No, 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 no. <laughs> Um, <laughs> what was I said about men being able to focus really well? <laughs> All right, one in every crowd. So white matter represents the networking or connections between different parts of the brain. So in men, we have these very highly developed centers that probably evolutionarily were really useful for us to learn a specific skill. So if we say for a man, you know, to really survive, what are some of the skills that we really should have had? Hunting. 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 Defending, what, ourselves. defending ourselves. What else? Running away. Speed. Running away. What else? Clubbing women. Clubbing women. Procreation. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what you suck. Go back. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Okay. Isn't that a bigger I'm sorry? Didn't uh, famous leader of uh, was it Harvard or whatever who lost his job? Summer? Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. Sorry to talk about some of this stuff, but we're here. We can talk so much of this stuff. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> These white matter connections, you see much more of them, are linking different parts of the brain. So women we became more highly developed, we believe, in looking at how to make connections. And so we talk about the different socialization. They are hardwired to start to do this better. Why was it useful for women to learn how to become much more socialized? Absolutely. What else? They were gatherers. They had to work together. They had to work together to get enough. Was you in for one child? Yeah. Absolutely. It's usually a sharing child care, actually. You know, women at that time were not quite as strong, and so they needed to band together for protection, too. When the men were out hunting, if they didn't band together, there was a risk of harm to the children. So they shared a lot of these things. Okay. Now Next slide, please. We also take a look. There's something called the Gorian Institute, which takes a look at studying, you know, education. We see the boys account for 70% of family grades, receive up to 90% of disciplinary referral, 80% of the kids diagnosed with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, are male. More boys drop out of school, fewer boys pursue higher education. And what they're saying is the craft apprentice system was well suited to a young man's developing brain. This is how educa education took place for eons. You had somebody who was a master in a craft, they would then apprentice somebody, and they would learn at their need. You know, these are some you know, other images that are popular you know, in movies now about the young apprentice learning. But it was really the active doing, sharing. You know, the teaching that way, it help boys learn. And if you come to convention, one of the ways that you learn is we have you sit, we have you up and doing too. You are practicing some of the things we're talking about. Work and job demands now have changed from the monoskilled mastery. If you think about the medieval guilds and so on, you know, men learned their craft, whether they were, you know, a blacksmith, whether they were a composer, it didn't matter. You learned it from your father, you learned it from his father, and his father, these were passed along. You sat in the knees, you learned from the young. Now we have to multitask and be highly flexible. That doesn't work as well with our brain because we're Remember, what's our brain suited to do? One thing well. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we take a look at some of the changes in male responsibility. We go back to 1960. Primary provider working outside the home. Very limited child care. Fine, as you weren't even allowed to see your kid be born, right? That was the waiting room. Yeah. What would all the guys be doing there in the hospital? Puffing away. That's right. They would do outdoor home care. That's a nice term, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's my own. You heard it. Yeah. And I'm out of care. Who changed the oil? It was the guys, the air filters, you name it. We fast forward 50 years and things start to look a little different. But Byron now working inside or outside the home. I'm just curious, how many of you work in the home or have that capability? Okay. Look at this. So we've got guys at home a whole lot more. Shared child care responsibilities, shared financial tasks. It used to be the guy had the checkbook. How many of your wives hold the checkbook now? <laughs> Whoa, big change. Uh, the personal Automotive care yeah. and driving the children cards. now. A lot of carpooling. You know, this is one of the issues with attracting some of the younger guys. They are now, they are multitasking in ways that they weren't initially doing. Shared shopping and cooking. How many of you do a lot of the cooking in your home now? 
Didn't used to be like that. Really? Used to come home. And really? Got your slippers and talked away from you. You sat in the easy chair. You got handed your beer, and then your dinner was ready. How many of you had that experience now? <laughs> we have two liars in the group. <laughs> Coaching, supporting other, our kids' activities and carpools. We now do shared schedule. We have to help arrange stuff, which means we have less of that limited amount of brain left to do other things. And now we're in a situation where we hit the sandwich generation. It used to be we had kids at a younger age, so our parents were younger. Now, with all you know, jobs and education, we're having kids in a much later stage. Our parents are much older. And so we're caring for two generations at once. Next slide, please. <coughs> Alright. As boys see, this is Rebecca Clues Dubro. As boys see fewer role models in synagogue will increasingly be seen as a female space. While women often clamor to participate in male-dominated institutions, female-dominated institutions are more likely to drive males away. I'm just going with that. I think that her premise is kind of wrong, because historically, the men controlled everything. So right. If females weren't there, like females on the golf course, this is where business was done. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're going to come back to that because we're going to do a quick presentation and we're going to have time for discussion if that's okay then. All right, next slide, please. This is a long, this is a lengthy slide. But the theory is women and girls have been conducting Jewish ritual and consciousness raising in all female spaces for a while, or photo groups and things like that. And boys can use that kind of empowerment too. Jewish community needs to enable boys to explore their gender and Jewish identity and safe. An educational environment so skilled and passionate facilitators. That's with you guys. And overall, I think it's time the issue of socialization into masculinity became a central topic in Jewish education and communal life. And this is what Rabbi Simon is doing. This is from the Jewish Daily Report in 2010. Okay, so how are we going to begin to deal with this? Next slide, please. So parents need to understand that their kids learn differently and that this hormonal development affects brain development. And when raising boys, we need to ensure that both sides of the brain are really being exercised because we know in the girls they have more of those connections already. If you want to build this, you've got to work both sides of the brain uh, with the guys. Okay, next slide, please. So, this is coming out of Raising Cain, Protecting the Emotional Life of Boys by uh, Kim Lennon Thomas. Uh, Thomas. Children with fathers who are present and active in their lives can be smart, be better psychologically adjusted, and more successful in school and obtain better jobs. We need fathers to take the rightful place back as the center of all. Does that work equally for boys and girls? Oh, oh yes, absolutely. But boys in particular, we see the difference because girls can do fine if the mother's there. The expectation is that the mother is going to be there. But it's not always the case the father's there and it has a much bigger impact on the development of boys than it does on the daughter. So we need to recognize these differences, start to leverage knowledge. Educate young fathers, provide role models, and this gets into the whole volunteerism that I know that I'm talk about. Steer our young men in the right direction and fully redirect them to what they should be doing and offer mentoring services. Huh? We see a few hats here that say mention, right? These are mentors. You see people who are consultants, they have consultants out here. You see people with K repets, these are other mentors. Next slide, please. What am I so, the more socially engaged young adults are in Jewish life with Jewish peers, the more likely they're able to marry or will marry Jewish partners from Jewish households and raise Jewish children. We heard about this last night when we listened to Barry Schwenk, who said, what's one of the key things you do? Well, you try to get them into a mosque, so we have some of the birthright, 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 uh, USY, Hillel. Uh, organizations like APAC and so on, people are taking gap years, Nativ and so on. All these kind of things make sure that Jewish kids and young adults are being involved in Jewishly related with their peers. This makes a big difference. That's like, we are needed desperately, and again, this is the crux of the, our, our problem. Worthy endeavor, networking, family involvement, connecting with tradition, volunteering. We need a male infrastructure, and FJMC is it for the conservative movement. We need empowering traditions. One of my favorite quotes comes up next. There we go. Huh, Chuck, want to read this out loud? I can see it. Many <laughs> <laughs> men who are accomplished in their craft or profession and feel inadequate when it comes to Jewish knowledge and observance. We need to remind these men that they have more Jewish knowledge than they think. 
and that strong moral, moral compass is based upon Jewish values, even if they haven't learned to read Hebrew. That's a very powerful thing. Next slide. So, what's FGMC doing? They're probably, ooh, what a nice region, nice. <laughs> <laughs> ooh, stuck it in. Publications of publicity, mention, hearing men's voices, training, workshops, retreat. You guys are here for this. Where are we going? Sensitizing men to maximize emotional and spiritual influence in the egalitarian world. Join a conversation about faith, you know, modern man. This is you. Last slide. So, this book was recently published at the behest of Rabbi Simon here. Jewish Men at the Crossroads. People are going to be seeing this very soon. Uh, it's for sale. People are getting copies. We hope you will look at this as a guidebook. And now we're going to turn around. Have a relationship, and if they're successful, they do. So, I, we, so essentially, um, now you understand what's, what's going on here. Oh, and there's one other, a couple other factors you need to know before we talk about how does this affect your men's clothes. Okay. Um, if we take the intermarriage statistics that we have from the National Jewish Population Survey of 2000, and we overlay this over what Paul just gave us, this, this broad, broad, broad picture. There's some other things that we learned. We um, we come to know we, we know, learn that um, in the first place that young men will uh, this is not related to marriage that young men will be hesitant to form long-lasting relationships or partnerships if they're not if they don't feel financially or professionally successful. Now we know that our kids are are marrying later and we're having fewer children, and we know from the slides that boys generally are beginning to up, which we can tell that they're you know, underperforming in, in college and in graduate schools uh, in terms of in relationship to women. And because they're underperforming, they're not uh, receiving the same kind of job opportunities um, that they did a decade ago. The competition is getting much fiercer, and our guys really are playing video games and too much sports, and they're getting by in that. And there are studies, we know this. I mean, there's a whole, go to Barnes & Noble, there's a whole literature on men's issues that sociologists and demographers are looking at. Dan Kim is at Harvard, by the way. Um, so, we, so we know this kind of stuff. Um, when we look at who our children are marrying, because we basically told our children that they should be part of the larger society, we know that they're marrying uh, or partnering with people they meet in the workforce. And um, you know that's uh, in, 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 in the university, and, and so that's that that adds to this because if they're not successful in in their profession, they're going to need a different group of people in the workforce. So all of these things kind of pay, you know paint a um, a very challenging picture of what's happening to men and specifically Jewish young men in in, in North America. So our challenge is to how do we rectify that 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 imbalance and bring it up to par, so that we're operating in an equal plane. We live in an egalitarian world. So how do we? And and the way we need to do that is to um, do what we do much better. Okay, that that's really really what it comes down to. How many people here are first timers? How many people here are those first timers? received at least one phone call welcome to the Femme Convention. Okay, how did it feel? That's what should happen in the shul. Right? That's what you want to happen in the shul. You want to feel welcome. And when you came here, what you met lots of people, and they didn't kind of say, they didn't go walk by you and ignore you. They said, oh, you're new here. Let's talk about your shul and about your family and about all this other kind of stuff. Well, that's where, that's, that's our strength, because, and, and that's what our shuls and our brotherhoods, men's clubs, are, are to a great extent, are, are lacking. So I wanted to start with that because we're trying to model in a, in a number of different kind of ways. And I, now if I can put that into the context, and then um, we'll just, and by the way, there are no rules here, so you stop, any questions, you'll just stop me as we go along. Okay. I read an article. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah, as far as religion goes. Sorry, yeah, no interview. <laughs> I hear, I read an article that grandparents have more of an influence on 
kids, their grandkids, than their parents. Grandparents have powerful influence. It's really something that you can understand that you're not always walking on eggshells. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you have powerful influence. The challenge with that is, is how are you going to, you know, model that influence? And a lot of times you say, Dad, you know, you never came to shul and did this Jewish stuff when I was growing up. Why are you doing it now? Yes. Okay, and then, so many of you might have heard this in the past, but this is a great segue to that, and hopefully I'll get to the things in my notes. But, um, so, two, two and a half years ago, we had a board meeting, and we go to the Pearlstone Retreat Center uh, once or twice a year. It's a kosher retreat center outside of Baltimore to, to do our work and to daven and spend the Shabbos. And it was Friday night, and uh, about 10, 10.30, we had uh, finished davening, we had finished, we were just kind of sitting in different schmoozing and drinking <coughs> scotch. And uh, the, our officers were there, Alan Goddard was there, Al Davis was there, a bunch of other people, Steve Newstein was there. And um, I looked at them and I said, uh, how, um, and also, now all of them weren't, are not shul mentioned, but they all have, we kind of coalesced together, but the thing that united us is we all had adult children who were no longer living at home. So, like Mills was there. So I said, um, so how many of you call your kids uh, Chavez and wish them a Shabbat Shalom? And I got tremendous pushback. Oh, my son's 37, he lives in San Francisco, we think I'd be crazy, I've never done this before. My daughter would think something's wrong with me, my wife would think, what's going on with you, you never did it. So I said, what if you did it right now, the Shabbos, by the way, and, and, all, and, and all of a sudden, everybody pulled out their phone and they were texting. So I kind of like turned around like this. <laughs> Um, next morning, you know, what we do is every when we go away, we always have to do something physical, about to go healthy, walking, a walk, some kind of exercise before we dive in because we gotta take care of our bodies. And um, everybody walked out with a smile that my daughter texted me back, Shabbat Shalom. My son texted me back. Only one person's wife said, Is everything okay? <laughs> So I said, we have to have a meeting. You know, we're very good at meetings. I said, so what, so, okay, so what are you going to do next week? Because we're going to do it again. I said, so what are you going to do when your child says to your adult child, says to your dad, you never did this before, why are you doing it now? What's the answer to that question? And the answer was, because this is important to me. And what all of a sudden, all of us realized, and I have an adult child not living at home either, all of us realized that we still had parental influence with our adult kids. Okay, and we were modeling for them and for the grandchildren. And if they don't, and if, and if they don't text back Shabbat Shalom, then I say, everything okay? And they're learning it, and they'll do it with their children. So, um, and grandparents, it's even, it has even more. But with grandparents, you have to negotiate in a slightly different way because, but, but you have to say, this is important to me. You've got to know what your values are. You've got to know what your values are. And it doesn't matter if you're a shul, that you're not a shul, that you're not a shul, that you're not a shul. Okay, having, having said that, let's put this in the context now of, of your clubs because you all want to build your clubs, you want to get people more involved, and the question is, how, and your clubs are all somewhat different. I mean, we might have common problems, but your cultures are all different, your shuls are all different. Some stand for the Shema, some sit for the Shema, you know. Okay, so, um, so the question is, how do you start? Well, the first place is you have to look at the culture of your shul and say, where are we? What are our needs, and what, what is the synagogue not doing that we could do better, or that we could do to supplement and help the synagogue do it? A lot of it is the stuff that we're doing today, you know, the breeding and the welcoming um, and, and the engaging. Um, tomorrow you'll hear Ronnie Wilson's film, because he's not well and he can't be here, and he'll talk about his new book, Traum, the Relational Judaism, which is about you need to have relationships. You know, it's not brain surgery. Uh, and one of the things he says is that we have a, a, for many of us, our relationship with synagogues is transactional. We transact for a service. I want a bar mitzvah, and when we've gotten our service, we feel satisfied, and we leave. We want to keep people more involved and engaged. We have to abandon that, that mercantile model, and we need to begin to build, build relationships which will get people Keep up with, make people feel they're more involved. Now with us, with guys, um, I have always found that we need a mission. And the men's club needs a mission. I want to know that I leave the world a better place. I want to know that if I'm a club president, that I'm not just having a program which is like having a party, 
but that I'm going to, that I have the ability to change family lives and make a difference in the choices they make and get more people involved. And we know if they get more people involved, and we know, by the way, even with intermarriage, if the intermarriage are socially engaged in the synagogue life, their children will be socially engaged in the synagogue life. It has nothing to do with conversion. It has to do with how they feel about the shul and the relationships and the things, because we're always modeling. We're modeling from the day we, you know, our kids come home. And if we drop off our kids, we, one of the reasons why I take issue with people that say the, if this, the reason they're leaving is because the synagogue is becoming a, a too, a too egalitarian a, a feminist place is because I think men are leaving is because our fathers and our grandfathers taught us that to drop us off and, to the, and then they went and played golf. So I'm going to do it just like my dad did unless somebody intervenes and helps me, shows me that I can have more meaning by doing something else. This is what I because we learn and we're constantly learning, which is really important going back to fatherly modeling. And by the way, this doesn't mean you, you got to put up the phone every day. What it means is that you're always modeling, that what's important to you as a Jew and as a parent needs to be told to your kids. Um, I'm not going to do all the things I wanted to. Uh, so I had a situation not too long ago where the, the guy in the shul where I'm a member, he's a volunteer, came to me and said, look, I want to talk to my daughter Maggie. My daughter Maggie is a graduate school at Columbia University, and she's, in, she's involved with a guy who's everything I would want in a son-in-law but. <laughs> so I said, okay, he said, why don't you talk? So she said, I said, so what's the question? He said, well, I want to invite, her to, to invite him to the Seder. Can I do that? I said, well, what's, what, if, if, if this is going to be the one, you better not only invite him to the Seder, but teach him to read Hebrew so it's part of the family tradition. So, so yes, and I said, he said, but I really don't know why she's, why she's doing this. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, she went to day school, she went to Camp Ramah, or you know, some other camp. She, you know, I sent her on a gap year to Israel, and she's involved with this guy. I said, well, um, have you told her how you feel? And he says, well, she knows how I feel. She went to day school. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, Tony. Have you told her? And we went through this. I said, no, Tony, she knows you love her. But you haven't told her how, how you feel. And, and Maggie needed to hear that from her dad. Not just when she was 25, but when she was 12, and when she was 6, and when she was 18. And if it didn't do it in the first 12 or 15 years, she needed to do it when you discovered that you needed to tell her how you feel. It's 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 really important. Uh, so that's a, that's a big, a, really a big piece in terms of in terms of men's clubs, in terms of parental influence. Uh, let's go on to it. What's the name of the thing? So. Okay, so I've been in a number of clubs that consider themselves successful because they have a lot of fun, and some of them do really good things and they fulfill really important shul needs. But um, what I also find is that in a lot of these clubs, no one has explained to the club leadership that they have a mission. Okay, and uh, well, what do you think a mission of a club should be? Well, I think membership of the congregation and the men's club, uh, it's our responsibility to make sure that the institution is there for the next generation. And most people forget that. Okay, what else? Let me hear. What's Our mission is to promote Judaism and and brother and fellowship and um, community and community work within the Jewish community. Th th this is our mission at the park. Somebody said to me, "Why are you? Gonna, I want you to join the men's club." And they said, "Why?" What would you answer them? How would you answer them? We want Jewish community. Help me. You can have Jewish men on the Jewish men. But that's nice. Good. Help me. Do their Okay. Anything else? Uh, We're a mitzvah army. We perform good deeds across the board for the community in general, in the Jewish community specifically. Oh, I'll clarify your thinking how you feel about the stuff that you're doing in the club. Because it will be personal fulfillment for you and what you probably really care about. How about setting an example for our kids? Yeah, maybe by example. Yeah. Well, other things, I think if you're a club leader, the language is a little bit different. Sometimes somebody says, Oh, I just got elected club president. And my response is, no, you just became club president. This is a powerful thing. This is the opportunity to, to, to change lots of, to lots of things for lots of people. Let's come together and think about what we need to do. That's another thing which I think is really, if you want to engage more people, I mean, I'm, 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 this is the show I want to be a member of, that I'm a member of, okay? 
And, uh, and, and I look forward, as exhausting as they are, to our executive meetings and to our by conventions and to the stuff we do because we bring people together to think. There's very little thinking which really happens in a lot of our synagogues. There's a lot of doing over and over and over again. Maybe the clergy does a lot of thinking of planning, but they're planning events. They're, they're not, and they're doing, working very hard, and I respect them like most of my colleagues, but, um, <laughs> but, they're, they're, they're doing, they're, but they're doing for us, it's like a top-down thing, and this is like, we're like a grassroots thing, which is really, really important, and, and, and I think that we need, so, we, so if, but if you bring people together to think about things, and you challenge them, how are you going to make this better? You get amazing ideas, and not only that, but you'll get, you'll get involvement. Because, I mean, one of the things that you all belong to shuls, and I'm straying a little bit, but you, most shuls, they, they send out a form every year, and they say, which committee would you like to be on? And a new member signs it up and fills it out, and no one ever calls them. <laughs> you know? No one ever calls them. Which is, and, and you go, oh, crap, you know, I volunteered, and no, you know, that's terrible. So, you wonder why you can't get volunteers. Then you're getting your way <laughs> But if you ask people, and you engage them in thinking, and then you see their strengths and their gifts, and, and, and you'll get new ideas and fresh ideas and you can modify things. It's not just about doing the same programs over and over. Programs are like parties. Initiatives build one thing to the next. Yeah. You know, you came up in the Masim Tovim Awards where a number of guys, you know, what, why were you part of men's club? Because somebody asked me to come and be part of it. And that's many, right. You know, and that's the first step. Just what you're saying. By going up to somebody on Shabbat, hi, why don't you come, you know, have a conversation and invite them to a meeting, invite them to a meeting. Okay, let me talk a little bit more about, um, about mission, because a number of our clubs don't have scholarships, for example. That's one of the things, that separates them from like a second, like a Knights of Columbus or Rotary Club. Maybe. <laughs> they have scholarships, so that's up to, to, to Jewish camps. We have a club in Toronto for years, what they used to do, because they wanted to get involved, involved their, um, their college students, so what they did is they and they knew that any college student who, if you want to increase the chance of in marriage, you want kids to study Jewish studies. So um, they created, I thought it was a brilliant bribe. What they did is they said, anybody who gets, takes a Jewish studies course in college and gets a B or better, gets $100 of pizza money after showing us their transcript. So, so all of a sudden, it's not bad, you know, all of a sudden, college kids, you know, it's, you know whatever it was. It was a, a nice idea. Um, but, but so scholarships or different kinds of things are in mission import, are very important. Uh, one of our clubs in Cincinnati, and I know one in Connecticut also, um, two years ago they, they decided they wanted to get multi-generations involved. And so what they did is uh, they had a big lawn, like a lot of our suburban schools. And so they decided what they were going to do is they were going to plant a vegetable garden. Okay, so they got, we have a lot of gardeners in most of our communities. Maybe they don't come to So they planted the garden. They, um, multi generational, they tilled it, they did all that grew food. Some of the food they were giving to the poor, some they gave to, they, 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 they distributed. They hired college kids who didn't have jobs, their own kids, to work during the summertime on doing this. So they learned some skills because most of our kids, if you live in suburban like New York, they're not around in the summertime. They, they go to camp when they're in high school and then in, and in college. So you know, all of a sudden, so it's, and they never learn these skills. And it's always said, you know, we're very good at hiring people. So, I mean, this is so with that well all of a sudden they were they were getting skills and they were teaching and, and the club had a mission. And, and, and it made and it made a difference because it involved people who ordinarily wouldn't have come to a basketball game or a during that voices program or something like that. Yes. Uh, and have I also sort of thought about this because we see increasing that my children in the twenties now. Is that the men's club should create an associate membership for people in their twenties because the synagogues do nothing for that age group. Except the only time the twenty year olds they come to the three days a year with their parents at the high holidays. What can we do to grow our potential future men's club members become before they uh, join couples because they have a families? What does that help transition? And so the, the, the challenge of working with kids once they leave our home is, is, is immense. And no one knows how to respond to that well um, because they move every year. You know, and if, even if they live on campus, I used to live in Poughkeepsie, so the synagogue was a quarter of a mile away from Vassar. But it was unusual for anybody to step off campus unless if they were like going to a rock concert across the river. 
uh, because they just, it's an isolated thing. And, and they didn't really, it's, that's very challenging, very hard. I'm not so sure where they want that, but there's a lot of things we can do to retain the post today Mitzvah kids that we're not doing. We're talking about this Sunday morning, but let me just share one idea, which we'll, I'll repeat on, on Sunday. Um, you could do this, actually. We have to change the paradigm. So, um, by the way, how am I doing time wise? Uh, and then we break into groups. So, so um, one of the things that um, one of our synagogues did in Peru, which was a model, which I thought was very interesting, when the kids reached B'nai Mitzvah, post B'nai Mitzvah, graduated from B'nai Mitzvah, they automatically uh, went on a rotation like a medical rotation. They went uh, two months on ritual, two months on education, two months on youth activity. They, they circulated through committees in the synagogue, ending up on the board of directors when they were junior, which let's say. So over a two or three year period, they, they, they did this, and they kind of learned how, was, how a synagogue worked. And then what, to make this, uh, and since a lot of these kids didn't have a lot of time, so it was one evening a month, you know, it's a meeting, right? Then they saw what they did is they wanted to supplement it with, with some kind of Jewish experience, because a lot of Jews don't have to do high schools, so these kids don't go to do high schools. So uh, what they did is they uh, would have a series of like Shabbat dinners, the services dinner, and they would have both speakers from the local community, somebody from the Coalition of the Homeless, somebody from UJA, somebody from Alcoholics Anonymous, various not-for-profit organizations would come in. Now, this is a, a, a kind of a push-pull thing going on here, because the question is, why would kids want to do this, and why would parents want to do this? And then let me take you back a step behind, because to run a program like this, you have to start when you're thinking of it so the kids are 10. So, and you say, what do high school kids most want, you know, at, at, as a result of their high school experience? Well, they want two things. They want to have sex, and they want to get into a good school. I can't provide for the first one. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be kind of But the second one, the second one, we could do something better. What do parents want? Their parents want the kids not to have sex and to get into a good school. <laughs> so, so that's the that's the dynamic here. So, we, so, at, so the kids go on to this thing. They sell it to the parents when their kids are 11. Okay, and, at the, and, and you can even maybe link this with a community college. But what happens is when the kids get to the finish their junior year and they're filling out those applications, we all know what that's like, most of us do, um, they also add something else to, to, this, to their application. They say, I just went through a two year program in not for profit management. Okay, because they've learned how to how school functions, they study with all these people in the, in the community. And so there's an, the incentive is. If you want to keep the kids, which means their parents, involved in the post mix of thing, you have to give them something that they need that's going to enrich their life, just like we do when we get guys involved, and all of a sudden, before they were afraid to walk into the building, now all of a sudden, after six months, they feel like they own the building, because they have friends, and because they're involved. So that's kind of kind of the piece that you have to have. Um, we've got to make people feel comfortable. And, and feel engaged. And that's what our shuls are. I mean, the, the bigger the shul, the colder the place. And yet they're all, when you walk in on a Shabbos morning, generally speaking, they're friendly places. I mean, we did a study, actually. And, um, it's not worth going into now. But the fact is, you walk in, people welcome you. You sit down, everything else. You might not know what's going on, but, but, but it's, a, it's, it's okay there. But we haven't told people that what happens in this, you know, the sanctuary is only one, one small part of what happens in the synagogue. You know, we're kind of the entry point for a lot of people to get them to that point. I mean, when the B'nai Mitzvah is going to arise, a men's club can say, that we have a club in, who's from Roslyn, see here? There was a, there's a guy here from Roslyn. Ten years ago, the Roslyn Club had a great program. They found one retired guy, and he worked with every B'nai Mitzvah child. He didn't teach Haftorah, he didn't teach his speech. What he did is he sat in the back of the sanctuary, special private meeting, had to kick up and read his speech, and he said two words over and over again. He said, slower, louder, slower, louder. It's a great program because you know when our kids are learning public speaking skills. And this guy, it was a fabulous thing to do. Um, we, can, we can, I mean, this is what we do well. We will bring people together, and it's it's really really important. Louder. I'm sitting at confused. I apologize. So damn good. Uh, I just think a lot of things that you're speaking about he did before. What basically is the function of a men's club? What's our mission statement, guys? Wait, wait yeah. really? What is the function? I'm hearing mentoring children. <laughs> Kids, our job is in our mission involving Jewish men and their families in Jewish life. 
That's the function. That's our function. That's the function. We're, our job is to get guys and through, through them and their families, if we can do it, more engaged and, and involved in Jewish life. They've made a step. They've joined the shul in many cases, which is a big thing in this world. If, you know, our job is to make, if we involve them in Jewish life, it'll provide them, it'll, it'll enrich their lives with meaning and their families and, and hopefully provide for continuity for future generations. Should the of temple Jewish. be doing that? The temple is, a, is that maintaining a building. They have wait, wait, wait. The temple maintains. Synagogues, the synagogues okay, try to do that, but the synagogues have, have big expenses and they have the heat and light and all this other kind of stuff that goes on. So synagogues walk very often while they try to provide those services. Those services tend to be more institutional. We're on the ground floor. We're the ones who make people feel comfortable, who build friendships, relationships. We're the ones who can say, Come on, you have a bar mitzvah coming up. I'll teach you how to do the aliyah so you're not embarrassed when you call for the Torah. That's what we can do. We're the ones who can say, you don't like coming to shul, but you join because you feel Jewish. Play baseball with us. And after a while of playing baseball, you'll say, I want you to do something at Men's Club Sabbath. You know, and you'll bring them, or I want you to do, you know, you're, you're a, a dentist. I want you to get talk about dentistry advances in a program because you want them to get them involved socially with their friends and their families. So the shul becomes part of their life, and as the shul becomes part of their lives, leadership Judaism becomes more part of our lives, and we and we and they are enriched from that experience. Part. Chef, uh, I, I I listened to um, uh, uh, an NPR program called Marketplace, right. and Kai Rizdal uh, interviews CEOs, and he asked them in five words or less how many of the company does. And it's incredible how many CEOs have difficulty with it, and the really good ones don't. And I I've just been writing down things that people have answered your question with. And they're really good. really good. And they're five words or less, like connect Jewish men, uh, bring people together. And, and I've got a whole list of them. And for a group to be able to articulate this is wonderful. I just want to close with one thing. OK, so um, we're going to break into groups and do, we'll do a lot of thinking about these things. And I only covered, touched on some of the items I wanted to. But you know, since we're working in the volunteer world, and it's really hard to fire a volunteer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so talking about succession and building is something we can't go about. But I wanted to share with you, sometimes it doesn't work. And in so many different things I've done before, but it happened to me about 10 years ago. Um, maybe 20 years ago when I was um, barnstorming in Florida. And in those days, our Florida region was, a, a, was an old region. Now it's a young region. It's a, it's a multi-generational region, and it's, and it's wonderful. But it wasn't like this a while ago. It was the Century Village region, I used to call it. <laughs> 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 okay. So I, about, so I must have been about 20 years ago. I was going to, it was one of my first trips down there. And I was in one of those um, large retirement synagogues that only with the men's club during the daytime. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and, um, and I met the club president, and he was, and I was sitting much younger, and he said to me, I introduced myself, I have to get to the Simon, so and so. And he said, I've been club president for 13 years. <laughs> and I was younger then, I didn't know very much, so I said, well, I think you should resign, you're doing your club a disservice. <laughs> and he said, no, it'll take the job. I said, how do you know? And he said, no, and we went back and forth two or three times, and I finally, I realized that I, it took a while, but um, <laughs> I realized I was not getting any place. So I said, um, let me learn, tell me about your, about your club, you know. And in those days, we used the word programs, not initiatives. You know the difference, programs are one-time things, initiatives build. And so I said, tell me, do you have any, what are your problems? He says, we can't get young people involved. Young, I don't know what young people meant at that time. There are no young people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, young people in the hospital. But anyway, uh, uh, but anyway, so, um, but I, I, said, I said, he said, we can't get the people by. I said, well, tell me about your, the programs that you use. And he said, we have, what's your best program? He said, we just had a great program. I said, what was it? He said, we had a, a post-colostomy workshop. <laughs> <laughs> It's not going to work. And when that happens, you have to just realize it's not working. I shouldn't get frustrated. But go on, because the job that you're doing is so is so much more important. And you just, that's the way it is. Okay. Thank
clarify where everyone's supposed to go. <laughs>